What business ethics can learn from entrepreneurship? Here's the abstract. Now, entrepreneurship is increasingly studied as a fundamental and foundational economic phenomenon. It has, however, received less attention as an ethical phenomenon. Much of contemporary business ethics assumes its core application purposes to be first, to stop predatory business practices, and then second, to encourage philanthropy and charity by businesses. Now, certainly, predation is immoral and charity has a place in ethics, but neither should be the first concern of ethics. Instead, business ethics should make fundamental the values and virtues of entrepreneurs, that is, those self-responsible and productive individuals who create value and trade with others to win-win advantage. All right, section one, three character types, Carly, Tanya, and Jane. Now, entrepreneurship is increasingly studied as a fundamental and foundational economic phenomenon. Schumpeter, 1950, and Kersner, 1978, were pioneers, and their successors have generated a sizable literature. Yet entrepreneurship has received less attention as a moral phenomenon and correspondingly less attention in the business ethics literature. So consider the moral status of the entrepreneur by contrast to two other types. Carly. As a student, Carly worked hard and received good grades. Upon graduation, she took a job, but at the same time, saved money and worked on her business plan. When she was ready, she took the entrepreneurial plunge and started her own business, which she developed successfully, and then a few late years later, sold for $10 million. She's now living the good life of travel, building her dream home, raising her family, and managing her portfolio of investments. Two, Tanya. Tanya also worked hard in college and upon graduation took a job in a financial institution. She discovered a flaw in its funds routing procedures, which enabled her anonymously to divert $10 million to an offshore bank, from which it was quick, quickly rerouted through several Caribbean and Swiss banks, ending up in an account known only to Tanya. One year later, Tanya resigned her position from the financial institution and is now living in discreet luxury somewhere in Europe. Three. Jane. While in college, Jane studied liberal arts and graduated with a good degree. Unfortunately, the summer after her graduation, Jane's parents died suddenly. Fortunately, they left her $10 million in their wills, of which Jane immediately donated $9.9 .9 million to charities devoted to the homeless victims of floods and to the planting of trees in the Brazilian rainforest. Jane invested the remaining $100,000 in a certificate of deposit, earning 8% annually, the proceeds enabling her to live frugally and without too much discomfort. Now let's ask the ethics question. Which of the three is the most moral? Whom should we uphold as the ideal? Should we teach our children and students to admire and to strive to be like Carly, Jane, or Tanya. Now, all three require strength. It's not easy to build a successful business. It's not easy to figure out a con and get away with it. And it is not easy to give away virtually all of one's money. Tanya is representative of a predatory ethic. She harms others and uses the proceeds to benefit herself. She is representative of the zero-sum, gain-at-the-expense-of-other practices widely condemned in the business ethics literature. Jane is representative of an altruistic ethic. She is selfless. She places what she has at the disposal of others in society, keeping only the minimum for herself. She is representative of the quote-unquote social justice practices widely praised in the business ethics literature. Carly is the prototypical entrepreneur and is representative of a self-realization egoistic ethic. She creates value, trades with others, and lives her dream life. Yet she is not discussed in the business ethics literature. She is the invisible woman. 
Yet the character traits and value-producing activities of entrepreneurs at least implicitly inform an ethic. To make this ethic explicit, let's begin with a standard description of the entrepreneur. Section 2, the entrepreneurial process. The entrepreneurial process begins with an informed and creative idea for a new product or service. The entrepreneur is ambitious and gutsy and takes the initiative in developing the idea into a new enterprise. Through much perseverance and trial and error, the entrepreneur produces something of value. He or she takes on a leadership role, showing consumers the value of the new product and in showing new employees how to make it. The entrepreneur trades with those customers and employees to win-win results. He or she thus achieves success and then enjoys the fruits of his or her accomplishment. Now let's expand upon each of the italicized and emphasized elements in that description. Entrepreneurs generate business ideas and decide which ones are worth pursuing. In the process of coming up with informed, creative ideas, entrepreneurs speak of vision, thinking outside the box, imagination, activeness of mind, and light bulb moments. Having generated ideas, they speak of exercising judgment. Which ideas are actually good ones? Can the product or services be developed technically? Will it sell? What does the market research show? Entrepreneurs exhibit a commitment to cognitive achievement, intellectual playfulness, research, experimentation, and analysis. Ambition is the drive to achieve one's goals, to be successful, to improve oneself, to be better off, to be the best that one can be. Entrepreneurs feel more than the often abstracted and idle wishing, wouldn't it be nice if I were rich and independent, that many people experience. Ambitious individuals feel strongly the need to achieve their goals. Entrepreneurship requires initiative. It's one thing to have a good business plan. It's another to turn the plan into reality. Entrepreneurs are self-starters who make the commitment to bring their good ideas into existence. A new enterprise involves venturing into the unknown, a willingness to take on obstacles, including the possibility of disapproval and mockery, and the possibility of failure. Consequently, entrepreneurial activity takes guts, a willingness to take calculated risks, to be aware of possible downsides while not letting the fear of failure or disapproval dominate one's decision making. Entrepreneurial success is almost never easy and overnight success is a result of sticking with it through the difficulties and over the longer term. That is to say, perseverance is essential. Entrepreneurs must persevere through the technical obstacles in product development, in the face of the naysayers who declare that it can't be done or who are otherwise obstructionist, and in the face of their own self-doubts. Entrepreneurs must be good at short-term discipline and at keeping their long-term motivations present in their thinking. The development process is almost always a trial and error process, requiring that the entrepreneur make adjustments based on experience. Successful entrepreneurs adjust to real-world feedback, which means being able to admit, admit mistakes and incorporating newly discovered facts rather than pig-headedly ignoring anything that is a threat to their pet ideas. Productivity. The development process hopefully culminates in a working product. If so, the entrepreneur has added value to the world by creating a new good or service, making it work consistently, producing it in quantity, and continuing to improve the quality. Those who transact with the entrepreneur, whether as customers, employees, or venture capitalists, engage in win-win trade, exchanging value for value. Socially, trade is a process of dealing with others on a peaceful basis according to productive merit. It requires protecting one's own interests and respecting the other parties doing the same, exercising one's skills of negotiation, diplomacy, and, when necessary, toughness in order to achieve a mutually beneficial result. 
Entrepreneurs also add value by bringing leadership to the trade. Entrepreneurs are creating something new, so they are the first to go down a new path. Those who go first set an example for others to follow, and especially in the case of a new product or, and service, they must show new customers the value of the new product and service, and must teach new employees how to produce the new product or service. Accordingly, entrepreneurs must exhibit leadership in showing others the new way, encouraging them through the, lead, the, the learning process, and in marketing the new. Part of the trade then is that the customer or employee is shown a new opportunity and is thus enabled to take advantage of it. And the entrepreneur receives compensation for doing so. Finally, the entrepreneur experiences success and the enjoyment of success. Entrepreneurial success yields both material and psychic rewards, both the goods that financial services success rather can bring and the experience of financial independence and security that go with it. And of course, there is the psychological reward of achievement, experiencing enhanced self-respect and the sense of accomplishment in what one has created. Section three, entrepreneurship and virtue ethics. Now, so far I've sketched the entrepreneurial process in terms of the traits and actions that lead to entrepreneurial success. What does this have to do with morality? Well, one major approach to ethics is through virtue. Virtues are action guiding character traits that aim at good results. The ethics literature is populated with many competing accounts of what the good results should be and consequently with many competing accounts of what virtues we should uphold. Some virtue ethicists make the claim that a character has priority in moral evaluation over rules and principles, actions and consequences. Now, setting aside the issue of whether virtue has priority, my concern here is to connect entrepreneurial success traits to virtues. Now, if we cash out the above discussed entrepreneurial character traits in terms of virtues, that is, in terms of character traits and commitments that enable and constitute good action, then we make the following connections. The entrepreneurs generating and evaluating informed and creative ideas connects to the virtue of rationality. Rationality is the commitment to the full exercise of one's reason. The entrepreneur's initial active and creative thinking are functions of reason, as is the exercise of evaluative judgment in determining which business ideas are actually good ones. The entrepreneur's ambition and drive for success connects to the virtue of pride. Now, pride has a forward-looking and backward-looking aspects. For example, taking pride in what one has accomplished. It is the forward-looking aspect that is relevant here. Taking pride in oneself means wanting the best for one's life, which implies a felt commitment to achieving the best in one's life. For example, taking pride in one's appearance means wanting to look one's best, which implies a commitment to health, hygiene, and style. So the entrepreneur's drive for success is a consequence of taking pride in the business part of his or her life. The entrepreneur's showing initiative by being a self-starter and committing to bringing the business plan into existence connects to the virtue of integrity. Integrity is the policy of acting on the basis of what one believes to be good and true. It is translating thought into practice. That is, one's thoughts are integrated with one's actions, or one's beliefs about what would be good are integrated with one's actions to bring that good into existence from planning. Now, the entrepreneur's commitment to action, despite the fear that comes from being aware of risks, connects to the virtue of courage. Courage is the virtue of committing to an action that one judges to be right while being aware, both intellectually and emotionally, of the possibility of failure. 
the entrepreneur's perseverance through difficulties, disapproval, and other temporary doubts, uh, doubts rather, connects with the virtue of independence. Independence is the virtue of trusting one's judgment and acting on the basis of one's best judgment despite short-term frustrations or the contrary opinions of others. The entrepreneur's working through the trial and error process of product development connects to the virtue of objectivity. Objectivity is the policy of guiding one's thoughts by one's best awareness of the facts, of being open to new facts or, to put it negatively, not wearing intellectual blinders and avoiding uncomfortable feedback from reality. A constituent element of objectivity is the virtue of honesty, the policy of not pretending to oneself or others that facts aren't facts. The entrepreneur's productivity connects to the virtue of productiveness. Now, productiveness is the commitment to the creation of value, to being self-responsible for bringing into existence that which one needs and wants. The entrepreneur's trading value for value with customers and employees connects to the virtue of justice. Justice is a commitment to evaluating and interacting with individuals according to their merit and a correlative commitment to being oneself evaluated and interacted with on the basis of one's own merit. Justice applied to business trades means that trades are entered into voluntarily that is, on the basis of each party's independent judgment, and that the terms of the trade are established by each party's independent judgment of the merits of the trade. And then finally, the entrepreneurs achieving success, including financial and psychological rewards of creating a successful business, a flourishing business, connects to the general moral values of flourishing, happiness, and fulfillment. Flourishing or happiness is the state of successful living. As one's business life is a component of one's overall life, the entrepreneur's engaging in actions that lead to flourishing in business is a component of an overall flourishing life. The entrepreneur's actions both constitute and lead to a life that is fully realized. Now, if we summarize all of the above into a table, we get the following. And here's table one, the left side listing entrepreneurial character traits, the right side listing related moral virtues. So the entrepreneurial trait of knowledge and creativity connects to the moral virtue of rationality. Ambition connects to pride. Guts connects to courage. Initiative connects to integrity. Perseverance connects to independence. Trial and error connects to objectivity, including honesty. Productivity connects to productiveness. Trade value for value connects to justice. And in terms of entrepreneurial consequences, the experiencing and enjoying success connects to the moral values of self-esteem, pride, and flourishing. Section four, an entrepreneurial code of ethics. Now the virtues and values listed in the right column of the table together constitute an entrepreneurial code for business ethics. That is to say, the list that started with rationality, that runs through pride, courage, integrity, independence, objectivity, honesty, productiveness, justice, and the pursuit of self-esteem and flourishing, that is an entrepreneurial code of ethics. The set of virtues is an abstraction on a description of entrepreneurial activity. The thoughts and actions of entrepreneurs are particulars of a general set of success traits. Those success traits of entrepreneurs are particulars of a general set of virtues. Now, in historical context, that list of virtues is very Aristotelian. Uh, see Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, especially his discussions of courage in Book 3, pride as the crown of the virtues, 
truthfulness, liberality with respect to money, that's in book four, justice in book five, and phronesis, right, or practical wisdom in book six of the Neocomikian Ethics. And it's also very objectivist. See Ayn Rand's essay, uh, The Objectivist Essay, published in 1964. Now, one important implication of the above is that an entrepreneurial ethic contrasts strongly to ethics codes prevalent in traditional and current business ethics literature. An assumption of much of the literature is that success according to business criteria and success according to cri ethical criteria are different things. A consequence of that view is that business is amoral and ethics is something that has to be imported or gra into it or grafted onto it. Or, in more extreme views, that business is inherently immoral and that the purpose of ethics is to rein in or restrain business. Now, by contrast, the above entrepreneurial code of virtues connects business to ethics positively. It sets a foundation for a business-friendly ethic based on the assumption that successful business practice has within it the resources to develop an ethic. Entrepreneurs are individuals who are oriented toward practical success. The commitments and traits that enable them to achieve the good, that is, success in life, are virtues. And virtues are the subject matter of morality and ethics. Entrepreneurship is a particular vehicle for moral activity. Or to put the point the other way, when we teach the skills for practical business success, the list on the left side of the table, that is to say, creativity, perseverance, integrity, proactiveness, being gutsy, and so forth, those are what we teach when we teach entrepreneurialism. But when we teach moral virtues, the list on the right is what we teach, and they come to the same thing. The moral is the practical. Another implication of the above involves making the case for the free society. The ethicist must be an ally of the economist and the political scientist in making that argument. Economists work out the commercial mechanisms of a free society, and political scientists work out its constitutional and limited government requirements. Yet while the economists and the political scientists of the free society have done excellent work, less has been accomplished in articulating, advocating, and defending a free society's ethic, including its business ethic. Nobel Prize winner James Buchanan made the following observation, quote, we true liberals are failing to save the soul of classical liberalism. Books and ideas are necessary, but they are not sufficient to ensure the viability of our philosophy. No, the problem lies in presenting the ideal. My larger thesis is that classical liberalism cannot secure sufficient public acceptability when its vocal advocates are limited to, does it work? Pragmatists. A vision, an ideal is necessary. People need something to yearn and struggle for. If the liberal ideal is not there, there will be a vacuum and other ideas will supplant it. Classical liberals have failed in their understanding of this dynamic." Unquote. Now, entrepreneurial success is not the whole of ethics, but it is a good start for business ethics. Ethical codes matter socially. We develop political and economic institutions to produce and protect what we think is the good. And what we think is the good depends on our moral code. And moral codes are crucial personally. One's moral code is one's spiritual drive. It is that which one thinks what is, excuse me, it is that which one thinks best, highest, and most noble. That says who one is and which brings out one's best. What we need is a moral code that idealizes the Carleys, not one that urges us to be Janes or that is limited to attacking the Tanyas. The key thesis of an entrepreneurial code of ethics is that business ethics should first focus on creativity, 
productivity, and trade. Creative, productive traders are highly realized moral individuals. That is to say that business ethics should take entrepreneurship seriously and foundationally as a moral phenomenon. First published in Journal of Private Enterprise, 2009.